Morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Weather Brains episode 950 for the 1st of April, 2024. It's James Spann here. This is the pre show for those that are looking for the actual show content. Move the slider over about 10 minutes, and that's when the actual show begins. We're going to look back to an event 50 years ago. We started this last week. If you watched last week's episode, and we'll continue uh, tonight as we look back at the great super outbreak of April 3rd and the early morning of hours of April 4th, 1974. And um, I, I w- not many people are left that uh, were alive when that was happening, but I was around. I was a, a senior in high school. Fascinating event. It's going to be a really interesting show tonight. If, if you're interested in tornadoes, um, uh, weather history, just uh, hang tight. And I know we have some very active weather uh, going on. In fact, I'm sure our Oklahoma folks will not be with us tonight. Uh, this is a quick peek at the uh, radar coming out of uh, Oklahoma City. And again, you can see that um, uh, we've got some fairly active uh weather here a lot of uh, severe thunderstorm warnings i've seen just one tornado warning polygon so far but again obviously rick smith who's the uh, wcm in, in norman and uh, um, uh, dr cloco mclean uh, they're probably not going to be able to be on the show tonight and uh, up in uh, tulsa where they'll have the active weather later tonight james ate a lot he's probably slightly busy and a lot of people have to remember that uh, we we do have real jobs <laughs> Uh, those of us on the show here, and we have to take care of those uh, real jobs first. But anyway, that's what's happening here. But let's bring in all of our guests. We have many people in the waiting room, and I was very uh, late in getting them in. And again, for those that are new here, this is the pre-show. This is the time of the show where we typically do three things. We share boring personal stories, humorous anecdotes, and from time to time, we say really outrageous things. And we try and say the outrageous things before the show begins at the top of the hour. That's when we go on television, and that's when the recorders begin for the audio version. And most people listen to this. Uh, But again, uh, so... We were looking at the situation out in Oklahoma tonight of all nights to have bad weather. It's just, uh, (laughs) um, and it looks like it's been mostly hailers. And I think that's the reason for the upgrade to a moderate risk was uh, hail. I've not seen that many uh, tornadoes there. The only tornado warning I see now is a little small one up there that's north of Stillwater, and there's also one near St. Louis, but that doesn't look especially threatening at this point, so we'll see how this plays out. But uh, again, we're doing the show here on the 1st of April, for those that are watching later. I, you know, some people will sit and watch these episodes from 15 years ago. <laughs> thinking, there's some good material there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really, I, I, I will say sometimes I will dive back into the archives and, and yeah. listen to some of those early shows, and they're pretty interesting. Um, well, they'll draw you right in for sure. And I'm sure, I'm sure you saw James the outlook for Ohio tomorrow. Yeah, let's don't do that. Yeah, it's awful. So I don't um, know. What Hi, Mayor Phil. Good. Hey, you. how are y'all? Hey, Mayor. I'm great. Phil, thanks. I know you're busy. Thanks for doing this. Hey, I'll, I'm going to enjoy this. It's the first time. Awesome. Um, yeah, you know, we will uh, we'll get started here at the top of the hour. The, and just for for all the guests on here, the, the way it works, we have uh, uh, we we hit the TV at the top of the hour, so we can't start the show until right at seven o'clock central. So uh, we just this is and, and we are streaming live on YouTube now. So we're live on the digital side we go live on the television side at 7 and and the recording that's that makes the podcast will start at 7 central uh so anything you say now will only be heard on youtube so yeah this so th- th- this is this is Jen's situation right here for tomorrow yeah yeah uh, oh no well come on now what do you have yeah, to say about that Jen tornado outlook mm. i am not liking it it is I was supposed to leave tomorrow to drive to Louisville and I, cause I'm speaking at their commemoration Wednesday morning. And I wrote to John Gordon and I said, I'm going to leave very early Wednesday morning and wait for all this to get out of my way. Cause it takes me right through just East of Dayton down to Cincinnati. So I just, I just can't do it. I just don't know what's going to happen. And we have such tornado fatigue up here. It's just, 
after what happened mid-March of an Indian lake and um, just north of me. So I, I really hope that that this doesn't come to fruition. And especially the day before the anniversary, you know, there's a lot of a lot of high emotion going on. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's um yeah, it's it's it, it it you know what we need to do a show with Kim and just on social behavioral science and where we are now with the tornado warning process. I, I just have so many questions for her. Uh, for, for those of us that work at my level, it's baffling. It's just baffling in terms of the chaos that's out there in, in severe weather communication. And, and I sometimes wonder, I mean, are we just this, this lone voice that nobody listens to anymore? Uh, some of the stuff I see, is, it, it is so, it's so much fear mongering. It's just horrible. It's just horrible. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting how it's come from 50 years ago. I was listening to all these famous air checks from WHAS in Louisville on the day of the outbreak. And, you know, it's, it's very mellow, you know, music, you know, break-ins, cut-ins. And, you know, it's like, we don't want to alarm anyone. You know, it, it was a whole different approach. It was very noticeable. But, James, on April 29th, we're going to have um, Christina Ballantyne, um, I think I'm saying that right. Um, she's a graduate student at Mississippi State. She's done some amazing work in how people perceive our television coverage of tornadoes. And I think that'll be a great opportunity to get, you know, Kim cranked up that night and and really work through a lot of, of these issues that that trouble us, including the ones you just um, that you just mentioned. And then the next question is, how do you define television coverage? Most people watch me on their phone. Right. Uh, they, they're mm -hmm. watching on Facebook Live. Well, and that or, this this covers that too. Uh, it's more about you know what graphics we show and how we uh, you know how we ab approach communicating that information. But I think I thought that would be a great night. We got to make sure Kim is um, glued in her chair that night. We may want to send yeah. over some. May want to send over somebody to help with the kids that night so we can uh, make sure she is uh, able to do the show. Friend of mine sent a, a Facebook message that you know Facebook post, and she's like, "Is this is this for real? You know, is this really going to happen?" And this was a severe weather threat that we had after the Indian Lake tornado, and some person who I've never heard of who says that they are you know a meteorologist, but and and have you know graduated cum laude and all this stuff, and I don't have a clue what school they went to, was making a big deal, drew a bunch of arrows and colors and everything, and it was like you know this could. If this happens and this is, you know, it's going to be just like March 14th, tick, tick, tick. And it was like the ticking of a bomb. And I, it, I about came out of my seat because mm -hmm. it's that type of fear mongering. And that we had nary a warning that came out from that. And it's just, everyone has PTSD, but people see that all over, you know, and James, you're familiar with this constantly where people just do stuff like that for the clicks. And then it's, then they look at us and go, well, you know, who meteorologists lie you know they make stuff up so it's just it's just frustrating and i, I will tell you and you know i'll probably get in trouble for saying this but this uh, mentality is creeping over into the professional weather enterprise to some degree and uh there's there's a culture change in the weather enterprise and this is across private sector and the weather service it's everybody and at some point we're gonna have to take a big deep breath and calm down here and uh yeah yeah uh <laughs> um I agree. Yeah, I, I, I'll probably say some stuff to get me in trouble. You know, we got this uh, uh, weather conference in Mobile uh, this weekend. Doc, Dr. Jacobs will be there. John Gordon will be there. Mm. I will be there. And th 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 there might be a whirlwind of controversy. So we'll see. Yeah. I want to check it. Catherine, are you with us? I just want to make sure you can hear us okay. Because I see that she's connected. I'm seeing a Nick Wilson here. Yeah. So that's Catherine. But we're not, she's not, she's still muted. She's, it's, yeah, that, that account is muted, both the audio and video. Yeah. I'll send her a quick note, make sure that she. She probably has not clicked on that. Um, this stream is, or this show is being live streamed now. She's there here. She so hey. okay. There we go. Hi, Catherine. It's so Hi. good to see you. Thank you for being here. Okay. I was trying to. There you go. <laughs> you don't want to look at my books. 
well, actually, we don't mind your vote. Well, I got why not? We have to look at Troy like every spy. week. So, yeah, yeah, yeah we don't wait, till, wait till Troy pops out here. You're going to be like, <laughs> talk about books. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for being here, everybody. I, yep. I just think it's so cool. We have we have somebody here from Xenia and Guin on the same show. Um, yeah. And, you know, back in 1974, the communications was nothing like this. And, and everybody was disconnected and. Uh, I just think this is, this is going to be very interesting for me. I, I'm looking forward to this. I'm going to sit back and press buttons and listen. It's just <laughs> like know. all the time. I, I go to these weather conferences, and, you know, they want me to come there and speak. And sometimes I just want to learn and sit back and listen because there's just some really interesting things that happen at these things. So yeah. I'm hoping to learn some things tonight that I didn't know about April 3rd, 1974. Your otter box uh, is on, William. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm going to let it run tonight. I want to. Ah. I want to see what it comes out with because it spits out a transcript at the end, and that might be interesting to have. So I'm going to allow recording for w Williams Otter Pilot. This is this is very disturbing. And welcome to our television <laughs> viewers. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't exactly. I guess it happens through Zoom. This, but anyway, welcome now, to our television. It, yeah, it's connected to my to my calendar, so it it picks up when I have Zooms and things, and it can it can record them for me, which is nice. the The transcript is what I thought would be interesting to see how accurate it is. All right, well, welcome to our television viewers. We are at the top of the hour, and uh, let me just say this for those watching on the TV side: we have no severe storms in in this part of the world tonight. We do have severe storms in uh, other parts of the world. That we'll talk about, uh, but uh, anyway, so you you will not miss anything. All right, Jen, I've got my format sheet up here. I, okay. I'm ex I'm nervous. I'm nervous. I'm, I, you know, <laughs> I, ha I have fat fingers, and it's like I don't want to press the wrong button here. <laughs> don't but, make uh, any mistakes, James. The, no, remember, fine. remember the 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 theme is called "Fix It in Post." If anything goes wrong here, because producer <laughs> JP is magic and he can do anything. No. Uh, all right, so uh, here we go. And again, I've got the new. Um, weather call show open, weather band show open. And uh, from there, we'll go to the Bill, not Bill Curtis, but the 1974 open from Jen. Yeah. All right. So here we go. And let's get the recorders going here. Track one and track two. And here we go in five, four, three, two, one. Join the American Meteorological Society by becoming a member of the band. The AMS Weather Band is a global community of weather enthusiasts dedicated to learning and sharing their love of science. Visit amsweatherband.org to learn more and join the band today. You've heard James say it a million times. Respect the polygon. At WeatherCall, we call, text, and email you when you're in the polygon. So in a way, we make the polygon better. With solutions for personal use, businesses, schools, pools, playgrounds, and RVs, there's a weather call solution that's right for you. Check us out at weathercallservices.com. It was a most unusual day. From the west, a cold front, riding in high on the jet stream. From the Gulf of Mexico, a low mass of moist, warm, unstable air heading northward. And when they collided, it became the day of the killer tornadoes. Presidential Weather Radar Station. Into Weather Radar now shows a tornado developing in northeastern Warren County. Let's take a look at it. At 50 miles, the tornado is indicated by that strong echo to the southeast corner of the center of the screen. That familiar thick hook now developing off the bottom of that tornado, uh, that uh, thunderstorm rather. The track apparently is taking it from northeastern Warren County into southeastern Montgomery County into central Green County. The tornado struck the downtown area of Jasper, 35 miles northwest of Birmingham. Ambulances have been dispatched and there is considerable damage. This is the same severe storm that is now in the Cullman area. The Jasper tornado apparently occurred at about 8.15 Central Daylight Time. Civil defense officials reported approximately six people killed in Lawrence County in northwest Alabama. So to bring us up to date on just what the situation is here in Louisville and why. John, I think for Louisville right now we are under a tornado warning. Is that correct? That's right. Since 3 this afternoon, we have a hook echo on the radar, about 20 miles southwest of Louisville, moving northeast about 45 to 50 miles per hour. Now, this storm will move through Jefferson County in a northeasterly direction, and reports have indicated up to this time that this is, is a tornado. We've had reports from Hardinsburg, 
They saw it there. We saw it at Irvington, and it's headed in our direction. So generally, people should take precautions for the next 20 to 30 minutes. Welcome to Weather Brains. What you've been listening to, these are audio clips from a horrific tornado event 50 years ago. 50 years ago this week, the great super outbreak of April 3rd, 4th, 1974. It's going to be a special show this week. This is episode 950, and we're live here on the 1st of April. 2024. And uh, again, just kind of strap in. Uh, this is going to tell the story of a generational tornado event. And we'll probably learn some things that maybe you don't know about the 74 event. I'm very excited about the show tonight. And let me just say up front here, uh, a lot of folks uh, listen and watch this later. We actually have some severe weather in progress now in various parts of the country. And accordingly, our correspondents in Oklahoma are absolutely busy tonight. They're not going to be able to be on the show. In fact, uh, Take a look at the Oklahoma City radar, and we've got some big hailers in uh, progress out there. So uh, we'll be missing uh, Rick Smith. Of course, Rick is the WCM of the National Weather Service in Norman. Dr. Kim Cloco McLean, who lives out in the same area there. And, of course, James Adelot is uh, working on television tonight in Tulsa, dealing with severe weather. And, uh, you know, the first week in April, goodness gracious, Troy Kimmel, you, you could write one book just on the first week of April, the weird things that happen this time of the year. Agreed. Agreed. Um, and this event, uh, April 3rd and 4th, uh, actually, believe it or not, a junior in high school in San Marcos, Texas. And back in those days, people laughed because I would go read the news in the lunch hour at KCNY Radio, which was uh, the local radio station in San Marcos. And I just remember, especially the next day on the on the uh, 4th, as we began to get a full uh, understanding of what had happened in the last 24 hours. I just remember the old um, UPI teletypes in the newsroom uh, of the radio station. And uh, and I, I just remember thinking, you know, uh, I've never seen anything like this. And I really hadn't. And, of course, for many years, this was the worst outbreak in uh, U.S. history, essentially, and until we got to 2011, James, and and got a little longer uh, in our in our history. But that's what I remember. That's I, I just remember looking at this as a high school student and thinking how amazing it was and how this was truly the big outbreak. Yeah, uh, it, it and yeah. again, I think, um, you know, we, we, Bill Murray, you, me, we, we have memories of this event. Uh, I, that night, uh, I spent the evening working at the Civil Defense. I was a senior in high school. Yep. Uh, in Tuscaloosa County, which was in the attic of the city hall. And, and when it was obvious that Tuscaloosa was not going to be affected, uh, they had a desperate need for communication volunteers with ham radio licenses. And they sent us north. The first stop was Jasper, Alabama. And from there, we went on this winding tour for several days. They gave me three days off. And uh, what, what I saw in Jasper and Guin, uh, it was life changing. And again, we'll get into this in a minute. But uh, uh, Bill Murray, you have uh, you, you, you. How old were you in 1970? Bill was probably in diapers in 74. Young man, no. young man. You know, I man. was 12 years old. And it is still a night that I remember like it was last Wednesday. Um, I, I had a great conversation, James, you forwarded me an email uh, from a gentleman named um, Lee Pinson, who was 16 years old in Huntsville and has the most spectacular recollections of that night. And we compared notes on Saturday morning. We had a, I was going to make it a weather brains extra, but the conversation was so fascinating. I thought God invite him next week to come and talk because at the end he said, Bill, he said, I didn't really know if I remembered a lot of the stuff um, you know, I, I wrote it all down and I, I sent it to y'all, but talking to you has brought it all back because we experienced the same things 90 miles apart. And uh, he's got some fascinating uh, information that he'll share with us next week uh, about a meteorologist who is a hero, James, that I had never heard of. And uh, but I saw evidence of his fingerprints all over survivor stories from the Tennessee Valley from that night. And I finally put two and two together. So we'll talk about that next week. But uh, it's an honor to be here tonight uh, with our guest. Jen, thank you so much for setting up this uh, spectacular interview and, and engineering such an incredible show. It's it's amazing to have an organized show, Jen. We don't know what to do. <laughs> Jen, yeah. Jen, take it away. You, you are the yep. great organizer here. 
Well, I will say I was in diapers when this uh, event occurred. Um, you were somebody. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just over a year old and I was talking to my mom about this event and we were living in Indiana and we were up in, um, up in the Elwood, Indiana area. And, and there was a point where most of Indiana was under a tornado warning that day. And so she was talking to me, but she goes, I just remember holding you as a baby and I was rocking you in the closet. And singing to you Cisco Kid by War and just trying to get me through the night. And, you know, because it was scary and there's a tornado warning out. So anyway, it was, uh, that's, I don't have a memory, but she does. And uh, we, we're going to share some memories tonight. I've got some special audio picked and we've got two special guests that I want to introduce right now. First of all, Catherine Kid Wilson, a senior resident, has a great deal of experience in public service, having worked in libraries for 20 years for taking her current position as executive director director for the Green County Historical Society in Xenia starting in January 2008. She served as a society board member for three years, and when the former director retired, she stepped in. Catherine, it's great to see you, and welcome to Weather Brains. Thank you very much. And we have Mayor Phil Seagraves has served over 35 years in appointed and elected roles in his hometown of Guin, Alabama, beginning with the Park and Recreation Board in, for 20 years, serving on the city council for four years and then was elected mayor. And this is his 20th year to serve as mayor. During his tenure, he created the first strategic plan for the city and led projects to revitalize downtown. Mayor Phil, it is great to see you too and welcome to Weather Brains. Great, thank you for having me. So before we get to the super outbreak and your stories and then the stories of Xenia and Guin, uh, probably two of the most talked about tornadoes from the outbreak, um, I want to talk about what happened before April 3rd, and this would be April 1st, 1974. There was an outbreak of about 20 tornadoes. Four people were killed, more than 70 were injured. And in Alabama, there were three F2 tornadoes and then an F3. The F3 was near Huntsville and damaged parts of Research Park and the Sherwood neighborhoods. And there was one fatality, William McCary, um, died in his mobile home. His wife and three kids were hospitalized. And on episode 114 of Weather Brains, we had on Alan Pearson, who was the director of the National Severe Storms Forecast Center at the time, and Bob Ferry, who was the MIC at Birmingham. Jay Shelley, as well, was a forecaster. And of course, our very own J.D. Elliott was on the show. And this entire show of 114 was also dedicated to the super outbreak. And James, I'm going to have you play this clip um, that is Alan Pearson speaking and he's talking about that April 1st event and then the call he made to radar operations on the 2nd. My part in it was uh, on, we'd had an, an outbreak up in the Tennessee Valley on April 1st and it was a strong impulse had then gone east and died out, but we had a very strong jet stream coming in over Southern California that was forecast to come through this, this part of the Midwest and cause explosive deepening on low pressure area. So on April 2nd, I went back and looked at some of the old weather maps, including one for what we call Palm Sunday, 1965, to see if I could find a correlation. And while it wasn't perfect, the correlation was good enough for me to send out a message on April 2nd to the radar station saying, uh, get your radars cleaned up and check your staffing. We're going to have a big day tomorrow. Now, now, Bob Ferry, when you got Al's message, what did you do? based on your recollection, to, to get ready for this thing? Well, I think we probably alerted all the people to be on their toes because we could have a wild period. And that, that's an understatement. It was certainly a wild period. 148 tornadoes. It was 315 fatalities in 11 states. 70 of the tornadoes were violent. They were F3 or higher, and six were rated F5. Town after town hit, tornadoes crossing rivers and mountains, Louisville, Frankfurt, Brandenburg, Kentucky, Madison, Hanover, Monticello in Indiana, Sailor Park in the Cincinnati, Ohio suburbs, Murphy, North Carolina, Jasper, Coleman, Huntsville, Tanner, and Alabama. And that's just a few of the communities of the hundreds that were impacted and they would be changed forever. And our guest tonight lived this event. It was originally called the Jumbo Outbreak. And our folks here were in two completely different parts of the country, but had same experiences, were almost like sister cities with the F5s that hit them. And I wanna start with Catherine. Catherine has uh, had me visit her at least five times, I think. <laughs> I've driven down to Zedian and, and spoken with her and 
Uh, she's been just a wealth of information and materials for Tornado Talk and, and being able to tell the story of Xenia. So Catherine, you were nine years old when yep. the tornado hit Xenia and hit your home in the Arrowhead subdivision. So would you please share your story? Well, it was an ordinary day. We went to my sister and I, my younger sister, and I went to school and came home. It was just the usual day. And then it started to get a little bit cloudy. We took something back to one of the local department stores, my sister and my mom and I, dad was at work. And we came back, we were going back home and it started to sprinkle on the windshield. We didn't think anything of it. We thought it's a spring shower. Drove back home. Then we started watching the weather out the north side of the house because it was very, very dark. That was that weird green color and the lightning was staying down a long time instead of like the normal zipping through the sky and it was staying down. So we thought, well, let's go look out the southwest side of the house because that's where all the weather comes from in southern southwest Ohio. So we went out and looked out the front door and there was a big boiling gray cloud. And I had a little weather book, one of those little, um, it's at the Historical Society in our tornado display. And it had those mammoth cumulus clouds. And I knew exactly what that was. So I said, mom, is that a tornado? She didn't answer, but she told me to go clean out the coat closet because we were gonna take shelter there. But there was one of those great big wall and sack tape recorders. I mean, that probably would have smashed us into little bits of jelly. So she said, go get in the bathtub because that was the only interior room with no windows. My subdivision did not have basements. We were all on slabs. So we got in the bathtub. Mom remembers thinking how weird it was to get in the bathtub with her shoes on. We took our, my sister and I both got in, mom got on top of this. Mom and I took off our glasses and then it hit. And the horrible sound and glass breaking, and then it was over. It took 500 years and it took two seconds. So we, look up cautiously, there was a big hole in the ceiling and there was a washcloth in the floor just below that. We did not have a purple washcloth before that. And then all of a sudden there it was in the floor. And that's also in our permanent tornado display at the, at the Historical Society. Shall I continue? Yeah, please continue. <laughs> yeah, just after, uh, you know, now, now all this has happened, you got a purple waft washcloth. You know what happens next as you guys yeah. emerge from your house? Well, I had on no shoes because that's the way I am. And so I think mom might have carried me or the neighbor might have carried me, my sister and I, down to the neighbor's house that wasn't nearly as badly damaged as the rest of everything. We looked around and there was rubble everywhere, lumber, a boat trailer, but no boat upside down in the street. We could hear gas hissing. We could hear electrical wires. All, everything was just everywhere. So all us kids from the neighborhood were two doors down. I don't know what we did exactly. I know we probably talked about what are we going to do now? I know my mom went back home to find some clothes and things to put together. We went to my aunt and uncle's house in Beaver Creek, which is about 15 miles away. And that's where we spent the rest of the summer, essentially, and building back the house on weekends when dad was off. And this happened in the afternoon. Uh, what was yeah. it the four o'clock hour? Yes. Yeah. For you all. Um I want to talk a little bit more about the aftermath in a minute, but I want to bring in Mayor Phil because about four or five hours later in Gwin, Alabama, he's a teenager and uh, was going through a similar event. And uh, before we get to your story, Mayor, um, I have another piece of audio. And this is from episode 114 again. And this is J.B. Elliott, and he's talking about the Gwin tornado. 
We believe it formed near the Alabama-Mississippi border, maybe near Lamar County, North Lamar County, and started moving northeast. And by the time it descended the ridge into Guin at 9.04 p.m., Jay had already issued a tornado warning on that, by the way, and people were standing outside uh, looking for the tornado because they heard the warning on the radio. It was church night on Wednesday night, and most people were home from church, and that is a blessing because two of the major churches in Guin, the First Methodist Church and the First Baptist Church, were destroyed. And had those people still been there, there would have been many more fatalities. But when that L5 descended off of that ridge into Guin, it first hit a uh, mobile home manufacturing plant, and it was so powerful that it bent the steel I-beams that are the foundations for mobile homes, twisted them like matchsticks, and then it went through the heart of Guin. And at that time... The parent thunderstorm had topped out at 66,000 feet and was moving northeast at 65 to 70 miles an hour. So if we do a little math on that, that's more than a mile a minute. And even on the largest size house and lot, it would only take it about six or seven seconds to wipe everything out. And it killed about uh, 32 people in Guin. So, Phil, talk about, take us back to you in that evening and you were a teenager and what did you witness and, and what was it like that night? That afternoon, the, the wind had blown continuously all day, and we had hail in the afternoon, but still we had never experienced a storm like this, and we were nervous. Uh, we respected the, the weather, but no one was prepared what was fixing to hit us. Um, there was two, actually, that we've all talked about over the years that came together outside of Guin in Lamar County uh, to form this supercell. And, um, of course, the, the communications in 1974 are not what we have now. So uh, no cell phones, the TV, uh, how many stations did we have? Probably six or eight. Uh, we watched some in Mississippi. We had two in Birmingham or three. And so that was our source other than radio and the local radio station uh, in Hamilton, Alabama, WRH. We were pretty weather savvy, and the, that was the station we would tune to. Uh, to get get local weather, but the the storm came in. It was continuous lightning. Um, you could see the lightning all around. Uh, the weather felt eerie, uh, and so uh, we were not uh, prepared for what hit us. Uh, they mentioned the mobile home plant, and it was Monterey Homes. Uh, their guard shack, which is small, as you come into the parking lot, uh, the plant was blown away. The guard shack was left, pieces of that. And Coca-Colas, and I'll remember this, were in wooden crates and glass bottles. The storm actually pulled the Coca-Cola out of the bottles and left the bottles still in the wooden racks. Uh, how can you explain that? You can't. Uh, Frosty Front, or one of our little uh, hangouts for, for eating, the same thing happened. The building was blown away. There was a potato chip rack with a potato chip still in it. So when you see things like that, you said, you know, this whole storm, you know, I used to own a piece of a two by four with a blade of grass driven in it. Uh, none of this is scientifically possible, you think, but it happened. Um, the, the night the, the storm hit, um, as I got into, I lived actually outside of Cuban a little ways. My, my parents lived right in the heart of town. Um, you were talking about the church. He was, uh, there was a church bus that had gone up the side street by my mom and dad's house. It pulled off on the side next to a bank by an oak tree. All the trees were blown in one direction, except the one big oak that was blown in a different direction and spared the church bus with people on the bus. So these are all things that happen, uh, that you say, why and why not? But, uh, when I got into Guin, from uh, that night, um, the uh, streets, it was totally pitch dark. The only thing you could see was car lights. And uh, I remember making it to my mom and dad's house, and they were okay. But there was eight people killed within a block of their house. And so their house was left intact. All the windows were blown out part of the roof. And the people that had lost homes were all gathered in their dining room um, with candles and and a state trooper car was actually in the driveway. It was one, and they were only one that was receiving any kind of information from the outside world was through the, the state trooper uh, that was there. So 
animals were everywhere. Um, I remember an Irish setter that ran up to me. Nobody owned an Irish setter uh, that was close by, and but there was there was dogs and all that was would run up and smell of you. Like where did they come from? And, and you don't know. But uh, it was very quiet. You could you could hear uh, people's voice and, and uh, from screams and hollering and help. And uh, so it, it was quite a uh, horrific night. Mayor, this is Bill Murray. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, my my family lives in Winfield and 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 lives down in Carbon Hill. And of course, we were very very worried about them that night. I called my grandfather after a, a weather service note that came across about six thirty that said something had hit Carbon Hill and that they didn't know what it was. And we checked on them, and of course, they were without power at that point, so they were isolated. We became there. Uh, source of information that night, what little information we could get. But Mayor, talk about some of the heroes uh, in in Gwen after the tornado. And then Catherine, I want to, I want you to answer the same thing. And then I have a another specific question for you, Catherine. But Mayor, if you would talk about some of the great heroes that that rose up uh, that that fateful night. You know, people in the in the South especially take care of each other. Neighbor taking care of neighbor, and that's what was going on. Uh, you were checking on each other to see if you're okay and going up and down the streets trying to find out uh, where the neighbors were. Um, a lot of people were doing that and, uh, of course, trying to, to find out who the injured were and, of course, where uh, those had lost their life for sure. Uh, it was common folks doing extraordinary things that were trying to get them to hospitals, trying to get them to uh, – Winfield had the closest hospital. Uh, but, you know, we ended up carrying some to Tuscaloosa, some to Birmingham and calling for ambulances. And uh, and that was the, the sad thing is that none of us was prepared for this uh, this tragedy that had hit and, and including the uh, uh, rescue personnel, uh, the fire and all. Uh, our city hall and the fire station was uh, was damaged. And so we were already handicapped with emergency vehicles and all locally. Uh, and, and nobody, uh, was sort of like in charge. Everybody was, was checking on everyone close to them. And so that night, um, there's a lot of stories, uh, of people that were almost working off adrenaline, trying to, uh, see about your neighbor. Yeah, that's amazing. Catherine, I, I know there were hundreds of heroes in, in Xenia too. Uh, talk about any of those personal stories. And then I want you to talk about the hospital because it was just missed by a block by the tornado, if I recall correctly. And the high school, if it had been an hour earlier, it would have been dismissal time. Talk about about those two places too, along with your heroes. Well, I, I agree. The, uh, the emergency personnel, fire, police, city management, all those people were heroes. There were individual heroes that helped other people pull people out of rubble. We had the train derailment on the west side of town over major route, which was West Main Street, US 35. And that hindered a lot of the help from Dayton. So we had people from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base come down and help. Um, Air National Guard, my father was in the Air National Guard at the time, and the Army National Guard Armory was in Xenia, and it got hit. Not as badly damaged, it was a little bit out of the way, about the same, a little bit south of the hospital. Uh, the hospital, it was a little bit more than a block, but it was still just outside. The most famous picture of the tornado probably was taken from the hospital. And this humongous black cloud, everyone's seen that, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, what was the other one you asked about? The um, high the school. School. And the high school, yes. The high school was practically right beside the armory, the park. It was right there. There were several people there for play practice, band practice, but school has had been out. Nine of the 12 schools in Xenia were either damaged or completely destroyed. So if it had been during school hours, the death toll would have been a lot higher. 
So we were very fortunate. Also up here in the North, Wednesdays at that time were, they had bankers hours. A lot of the downtown businesses closed at noon. So if they had been in the downtown stores, who knows how many would have been killed or badly hurt. So we were, we were quite fortunate in some ways. Catherine, a question for you, Troy Kimmel here. Uh, what was the population of Xenia at that time? Approximately, I don't mean to have to pick your brain, but I'm just kind of. No, that's all right. Uh, uh, probably around 25,000 or so. Okay. Okay. And that, hey, Phil, what, was Marion County High School destroyed in Gwin? No. No, this, the school was spared. Uh, we had a hospital as well as Winfield, and it was partially hit that night. Um, our baseball field and, and things behind the elementary school was all destroyed. Uh, so it, it came at an angle uh, going northeast through Ewan uh, on to Twin or Yemper Town was the other little community that got hit as well. Uh, so, But it, it took a big swipe, probably a half a mile wide or so through the center part of our town. Um, and it was uh, very violent, as y'all know. Hey, Aaron, how, do you, how do you think the tornado shaped Gwen as a community after that night? You know, there's there's parts where, where I guess had a, had a very strong spirit of building back, uh, but there's there's part of us that died with that that storm that night that that did not build back. All of our uh, a lot of our historic homes, or which would be historic today, were blown away. So we don't have the historic uh, neighborhood or homes that a lot of communities has. A lot of independent business people did not reopen, and, and that that hurt, especially our downtown. Uh, but then uh, we had the spirit to to come back and reshape and and uh, build back, and you know we have done that. Uh, as we have expanded even now to I-22 and all. So uh, that's way down the road. But uh, uh, we could have easily folded the tent and said, you know, we're out of here. But uh, that did not happen. So a lot of people, we had a lot of help, uh, especially from uh, the Red Cross, Salvation Army, the Amish came in later. The National Guard, of course, was, was here that night and arrived later. Uh, but we were on our own for a long time. Uh, you, you think about the communications and, uh, but this was also going the warnings and all in our surrounding communities. You know, we were not the only one hit that night. And so, uh, as I say, a lot of other cities were having their own problems as well as we, uh, dealing with this storm that they went all the way up into, uh, Tennessee, of course. Uh, we, our post office was blown away. Uh, numerous letters were mailed back to you and from, uh, people that found these letters, as far away as Tennessee. And so that was uh, pretty common for several days later. And, and Mayor, my, my uncle was a, a National Guard member, and they were there on, I think, Easter Sunday was like 10 days after the tornado, maybe, 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 maybe that same week. And you might remember better than me. But we went up there, and he allowed us to, you know, see some sights. One was of a bus. Uh, it could have been a church bus. It could have been a school bus. But it was literally – wrapped around a pole our our baby's uh, church bus was parked across the street from our church and it was a uh, greyhound type bus it was not one like we have now and it blew the bus about a half a block into the tom bigby electric building um and that bus is pretty heavy and and it was uh it was tossed like it was, uh, uh, it was one of my classmates had pulled off the road and was parked beside this bus. And again, another strange, strange event. He got down the floorboard of his pickup. And when he raised up after the storm went through, the bus was gone and his truck was still there. So he was spared. So, uh, and these are another phenomenal phenomenon that you can't, uh, explain, uh, how things work. Um, uh, and uh, a train was also coming through at the same time uh, that had actually uh, was not derailed, but uh, weathered the storm as well uh, that had actually uh, 
either they had been warned somehow but they actually stopped along the tracks to let this storm go through. Mayor, I'm going to ask you the same question that uh, that I asked Catherine. What was the population of Guin back then? And even compared to today, that's something I didn't ask Catherine, but what is population back in 74? You know, I tell folks, I get asked that, especially when I travel, and I always tell them that we're under 50,000, <laughs> but we're way under 50,000, okay. about 2,500. Okay, okay. It's a small town. Yep. One thing that, that I would ask you, and then I'll probably get with Catherine on this as well, having grown up, I'm a native Texan, but grew up in the south in northeast Mississippi, and for my tornado uh, event in Corinth, Mississippi, on April 19, 1970, um, the thing I remember for years in a town of, what, eleven or 12,000, was how it it absolutely changed how people reacted to severe weather events. We had a uh, basically a bomb shelter. If you remember the shelters that we had back in the, back in the seventies um, at city hall and for 10 to 15 years after that April 19th event in 1970, people would just instinctively go to city hall to seek shelter. This is something that remained on people's minds. And I think really frightened them for many years afterwards. That's worn off with time. I've seen that in the community, but I'm, I'm, I have a feeling that both Mayor, as well as Catherine, you probably can tell that same story with Ewan and, and with Xenia. Uh, that's very true. Uh, just a, a good clap of thunder would send us to our uh, yep. storm houses. Uh, and and a, lot of, a lot of those have been built uh, since then. There was not that many in 74. Uh, but people were very weather conscious and respect the uh, the weather for sure. Um, it's maybe we've lost some of that now. Yeah, uh, I know. I know, especially those that didn't experience that that time and and that storm. Uh, they're not quite as scared as they should be of the weather. Um, and uh, the 2011 storms. Uh, hit Hackleburg. We we all got to see that, and it, which is just up the road from Gibbon, uh, and, and that was a, a storm in comparison to to ours. Uh, yeah. I think probably wider and stronger than our storm. But um, we need to be definitely, as James says, respect the the polygon. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah that sure. Bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Mayor, one thing that is interesting out here in Texas is the city of Gerald, Texas. And a lot of us remember the uh, EF5 and, and on May 27, 1997. And uh, right now around the Austin area, if you want a storm cellar, you go to Gerald, Texas, because they built more in the wake of that. And it's, it's really interesting talking to people there because all of a sudden the expense of a storm cellar overtook the need for a new car. When you know someone in a community, if you're in a community as Gerald was back in 1997, everyone in that community knew at least one or more of the 27 people killed. And I think that probably goes for Xenia. I think it probably goes for Guin as well, that you change, it, it changes your view of life, essentially, and, and what you're going to spend money on and how you're going to protect yourself. Um I noticed, Catherine, you were kind of shaking your head a few minutes ago. How is uh, – you've been there, You're, and I love it that you're with the Historical Society mm. and, and that sort of thing, but what happened in the years after that? I assume there was a memory of that event for a long time in Xenia. Absolutely. I, I still have tornado dreams. Hmm. Where, they're, where, they're, where I can't get away from whatever it is, especially when I'm under stress. I have a weather radio at home and in my office. I had someone actually call me at the Historical Society. They wanted to move to Xenia, but they wanted to know where the tornado's path was. I said, it's going to hit wherever it hits. Yeah. But they wanted to know exactly where and where they would be safe if they bought on a certain area of town. Was it hit in 74? Was it hit in 2000? Well, it comes when it comes and it goes where it goes. So I can't really tell you, but yes, there are, there are commemorations. 
But for a while, there were no commemorations because the people that were in charge in the city had been through it. So they didn't want it commemorated. They didn't want to draw attention to it. So they would have some kind of a, a prayer breakfast that wasn't well attended or something along that line. With the 40th anniversary 10 years ago, it got a little bit more of a commemoration. And this year, we're also doing one. Thank you. And we have over 29,000 now. That's what our current population is. Yeah. We, we have uh, since built the first in the nation senior center and safe shelter combination. Um, and we're very proud of that. But we took uh, two, two, uh, two uh, uh, different agencies, federal agencies, and used that money to build uh, one structure. The, the bottom half is the safe shelter. Um, on the night of 2011, there was 127 folks hmm. in that shelter. Uh, and then the, the top half is our senior center. So the, uh, uh, they were, it's where two federal agencies work together to, to create something pretty nice. Uh, the communications and weather warnings, which y'all uh, know about that now, is so much better than it was in 1974. Hmm. Um, we still have, I know, the outdoor uh, sirens, that's not the only thing. Uh, if you're outside, maybe, and, and you're not close to your phone or weather radio, then you hear the sirens, and we, we have the radios, of course, and and uh, also the the uh, system that calls you with a, uh, severe weather as well. So, well, there's several uh, options that we have to, to get the weather now, but still, um, to see what uh, as many storm storm shelters and safe shelters and things that we have now that we didn't have in 74. Uh, humorous story. Uh, we recruited back in 2007 uh, an auto assembly plant and their headquarters was in Grasse, Austria. And I'm meeting among other Alabama uh, mayors and the Department of Commerce people uh, lunch with uh, the corporate folks that from uh, Germany that we were talking to and this big, big German sitting across the table from me. And in, in the middle of the conversation, he stops and looks at me and says, you tornado alley. And, uh, <laughs> and I thought, where did that come from? And so uh, the uh, director of the department of commerce looked at me like, how are you going to respond to that? But even in Gras, Austria, where we were, this German knew about Gewen mm -hmm. and a tornado. And they had done their, their research uh, on the weather, and that's how important. And I had to address that, uh, how we deal with weather in the south. And uh, yeah. that was one of the questions. Did he, did you he know, build a, a strong uh, tornado shelter in the middle of his plant? Yeah, uh, I told him uh, that we were, and I didn't. I didn't lie, but uh, I told him we were not Tornado Alley. That that was more of Oklahoma and Kansas and then the mid Midwest. And then we had occasional storm, and I didn't highlight our '74 storm with him because I didn't know where the come, question had come from. But uh, uh, he definitely was on his list of things to ask me. So. Well, if, uh, I'll, I'll tell you this, Mayor, and I tell you this, Catherine, and I say this to Jen all the time. I don't know quite how to say this, but I'll say it. But thank you for helping us remember and telling the story. And that's what Jen does so well in Tornado Talk. And um, and I just think it's important we remember where we've been to understand where we need to be in the future. And even with events in 1974, 50 years ago, um, thank you for helping us remember in both cases. Thank you. And, and well, Catherine, your town has had quite a history of tornadoes, even beyond the 1974 tornado. I heard a long time ago, there was a legend that, uh, okay. is that true? Is that legend just truly a myth? Okay. Yeah. Good. I'm, I'm glad to have that dispelled. That's <laughs> that I had never heard that before the 2000 tornado. Okay. I've never heard that. I have, I have worked with Shawnee people on other projects and they're the only Indians that were in this area at the time and during historic times. So I've never heard that from them. My predecessor who was at the historical society 
in November of 1974, all the way through 2008, she had never heard it before the 2000 tornado. So that is a legend, and I want everyone to know that. Good. <laughs> Just crazy. <laughs> and Mayor, I know my 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 uncle and aunt built a, a storm cellar after a storm pit. They called it uh, after that. And the kids always wanted to play in it. But to me, that was sort of a sacred place. We only went there for one reason. And I refused to go in it unless, you know, we were, you know, under threat of severe weather. So mm -hmm. I'm sure, as you mentioned, a, a lot of storm pits got dug uh, across northwest Alabama after that event, like you were saying. So a lot of ties between these two cities. They're two of the most uh, famous ones from the outbreak or infamous ones, I guess. And, uh, you know, that I, I, I'm sure there's a, a kinship there, and I'm glad we have both of you on the show tonight. James Spann, I walked all over you a minute ago, and I didn't mean to. I know you had something important to ask. No, I, just, I was just curious for, for both of you. Um, do people ever talk about it? We're, let, let's, let's be yeah. honest here. I mean, this is 50 years ago, mm -hmm. and most of the people that experienced this, they passed away. There's not that many of us left. Do, do people in Guin and Xenia still talk about April 3rd, 1974? Yep, Absolutely. Yes. Yes. My, my classmates, all of us went through it. All of us, some of the people that didn't move away afterward, we all went through school together. We were the last class to be the combined junior high schools. There were two high school, junior highs, one high school, and everybody went together. Their, ours was the last class. The next year, they had rebuilt both of the junior highs. So we split up when we all got back to high school, we knew each other. So we were a very close class and we still are. And we do talk about it. I had just had one of my classmates. She is doing her first interview on TV this year. She never wanted to talk about it, but she's doing it this year. Wow. So whatever that means <laughs> to, yeah. the, to the greater scheme of things. Especially yeah. after the, the um, relatives of those that lost loved ones, uh, they they talk pretty frequently. Um, it's probably the number one question I get asked about our city when I'm away from you and at various meetings and all. Um, we're tied to weather history, just like Xenia, yeah. uh, the 74 outbreak. And if anybody knows anything about weather history, they'll bring that, that question up to me. Y'all were blown away in 74. Uh, and... Uh, there's two questions I get asked a lot about, and that's one of them. Um, but yes, the, it's still on folks' mind. This really, this is one of the things that's really been powerful as Tornado Talk has been studying both of your cities for the past uh, year and doing the research. And it's the lasting impacts of the events on folks and the emotions that continue to well up. and. I want to tell her just a quick story. Um, when we were in Alabama, we had gone to Guin, and then we uh, the next day we made our way up through Jasper, and then we went up to the Winston County Archives. And um, I we were running late because I was talking to the 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 lady at the Bankhead Museum, and I was just. Catherine knows I I yeah I'm just completely I'm talking all the time and I just <laughs> I, I just want to tell I'm just so animated and I want to tell a story and I'm talking to this lady at the at, and uh, we were running late getting to the Winston County Archives by a lot and we walked in there was this little lady sitting there and she had been waiting for a really long time to talk to us to be interviewed and she was when the tornado left you and it went up through uh, Yampertown and then it went up into Winston County into it's a, an area around uh, Del Mar and then up through uh, not far from Haleyville and it was in the very rural areas and her home was hit and her mother-in-law passed away and she was there and she wanted to tell her story. I felt awful for being late and she was so gracious to me and I sat down and I ran the recorder and just had her tell her story and as she's telling her story, her mother-in-law passed away. Her two daughters were in the cellar too. And the one daughter was walking down with her grandmother and watched her die and get hit by all the debris falling into the, the cellar. And um, 
toward the end of this clip I want James to play, you can really hear the emotions of, of how, you know, 50 years later, it still has an impact on her. So James, if you could play that from Bessie Berry. Ozzy had said when it started, it had started hailing and they was upstairs with us and they said, we better get in the basement. And we went on down there and we had some freezers in the basement, two chest type freezers. And when it started getting kind of rough, he said, let's get down there by the freezers. And it caved on in on Miss Perry before she got down there. Oh, Gina was holding her, was walking with her, but she didn't make it. I was on the other end and uh -huh. it blowed the house away, took all the paint off my car. It was sitting in the front of the house. Mm -hmm. And his pickup, it was a new pickup, and it blowed it down in the woods somewhere. And somebody stole some of the tars off the next night. Well, the youngest one had been sick that day, Tina. And uh, I went, when the last time I'd seen her, she was laying on the bunk praying in under there, and I went down to feel on her, to feel the, the bed to see if she was still there. But she wasn't. She had run with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, but Gina, she never did get over it. Really, never did get over it. Just was to put her down as a. She lived till she was fifty four, but mm -hmm. she was in misery that whole mm -hmm. her whole life. I just cannot. <laughs> her, she was so wonderful, and you could just tell that you know her daughter just never got over that. And it's, it's such emotional, but she wanted to share her story. It was so important. And when I talked to her after, and I, I'm like, Miss Barry, can I please give you a hug? And she's like, of course. And I gave her this hug and she wanted people to remember her daughters and her mother-in-law and her family. And I think that that's a lot of what goes on when we remember these events. And I want to just ask uh, Catherine, you know, as, as you, have uh, just done such a wonderful job at the Historical Society. And I know it could be a lot to to go through this event all the time. Um, why do you, why do we do this? Why do you want to remember what happened? And, and is it healing for folks? You think? Um, you know, what's the importance of doing and remembering? It's hard for me to say because I was in it. The people that come to the Historical Society to learn about it, a lot of them are severe weather fans, for want of a better term. I don't know that they want to remember the people who died. They want to see the damage. They want to study the damage. I, I think that's kind of a, a side note to remember the people and the effect it had on the town. But the people that live there or are moving there or have not lived there as long as I have, I think that is part of it because we are so resilient as Xenians. They kind of want to know where that came from. And mm -hmm. that's part of the story. And that's why I feel sometimes that that's part of why I'm at the Historical Society, enable, enabling me to tell that story from a unique perspective. And, and Mayor, for you too, you know, when we came to visit you at, at City Hall, I mean, you had everything laid out on these tables for us and shared stories and we interviewed you and talked to everybody. And so everybody was so gracious and it was so important for you to share the city of Gua. And why is that important? Well, we're a, uh, a victory. We overcame. Um, tornadoes are still with us today. Now, that was a 1974 model, but the 2011 is still the same model, still the same storm, still the same. So how do we deal with it? Well, you learn from history. Uh, we've overcome a lot. Technology's changed, uh, but there was people's lives that were changed as well. Everybody that lost property, everybody that lost anything. But those that lost their lives, their families will never forget them. Uh, and they're they're uh they've got a story as well uh, lives that were cut short just like you know almost like you've gone to war um it was compared our city was like a bomb had hit and, and blown things uh, away so there's story after story but there was adversity that we overcame 
uh, to, to where we are now. And, and I think it needs to be told that if it happens to your community, are you prepared? Uh, and, and there's a story that we all can share with, with communities. How do we prepare for the, for the next storm? Because they're not going away. Uh, they're going to be here tomorrow, uh, here tonight. So uh, we have to, to deal with that. And we're a, uh, a story that, that in a town that has dealt with it, Xenia and us. The similarities between both of your stories is amazing. As I've past couple of months, I've dived this dived headfirst into both of your stories. It's it's so amazing. Um, and one thing that we have tried to do, and this is it, it. Yes, as a meteorologist, it's interesting to look at the damage. But I think as meteorologists, it is we're doing ourselves a disservice if we don't learn about the people because that's exactly why we're meteorologists. We're supposed to be helping people. And we need to tell those stories. And so I've tasked my team that every time we write a tornado event, that we find the names of those who passed away so we can honor their lives and their memory. And uh, we go as far uh, as making sure that we know their full name and even their nicknames. So people, if they do read our story, they can go back and see that, that we remembered them um, and we try to tell their story. And we also try to tell the survivor stories, you know, the stories of those who uh, who were heroes during the event, who protected, in, there were several in Xenia, Catherine, that, that we just wrote uh, of moms who were uh, babysitting kids and they had, you know, six, seven, 10 kids under their care and they put cushions together and, and, and held and made sure that they were okay. And, uh, and they all walked out and, and were okay. I mean, and it was it, just some amazing stories. Um, I want to just personally thank you both for keeping the memories of both cities alive and and telling your story and wanting to people to know your history. And we have been honored to uh, to be a part of your of your storytelling. And I know Bill has a couple of more questions that he wants to ask too. Yeah, I could I could talk to both of you all night long. Mayor, there was a young man who recorded the tornado uh, in his in his window. And I was always awed by that as a young person. Talk about his story. And then did you know the Browns, Billy Joe, Billy Joe Brown and uh, daughter Janet that were killed by the killed in the tornado in Guin that night? Yes. Um, this this book I went to run grab a second ago. I, I, I share it all the time because to me, this book right here uh, is is a miracle. Uh, because a man in Moulton, Alabama, went around, around and recorded all of the survivor stories that he could get his hands on. And it is spectacular. They're, they're all verbatim, you know, just what they said. And so many people that day, Mary, and you referred to this earlier, uh, said, you know, that the wind sounded lonesome uh, that day. And people were worried. And there was a tornado in 1956 that I had missed. Talk about that tornado, the tape recorder, and, and you know, if you knew the Browns. The, the 56 storm was, I, I don't remember that one. But, well, I know you uh, weren't alive then, but, but, yes. <laughs> did, did, but did you uh, hear tales of it, or was it uh, is something that was in the that, recollected memory? That that was one, I think, that probably hit in February um, in 56. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. The, the 3M company is, is uh, one of our Fortune 100 companies, and uh, they they came from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and so they all built in this street, uh, and the the nickname of the street was Yankee Street uh, because they were Yankees that came south, <laughs> and so that storm of '56 hit that street. I can remember that, uh, and, and uh, as far as what what they've shared with me. And so that was uh, an early uh, storm. Uh, Guin was also uh, hit by a storm in November uh, uh, of uh, 73 uh, before. So we, we were sort of in the, the uh, I guess, bullseye of the tornadoes. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, of course, the one in 74 that, that hit. Uh, Alan Lindley was the, the young man who put the tape recorder in, in the window and recorded this actual storm as it went through. And it may have been, I think, one of the first ever that was recorded. Um, and, and that was, uh, we have that on CD uh, still. Uh, I don't know, uh, Jen, did you get a copy of that? 
Yeah, it's okay. actually on our overview now. Uh, okay. so, and I've had more comments on that. People have listened to it and have just been absolutely blown away and, and just in awe of the sound and the roar from that uh, from that audio. It, it was amazing. His house, uh, he raised the window in the upstairs and stuck the tape recorder uh, right in the windowsill. And the house across the street was blown away and the one right on the other side of that was blown away and their house was spared. Uh, so it's odd how uh, that happens, but, and the tape recorder was not blown out of the, uh, the windowsill, which was open. Mm -hmm. So, uh, he, he later sold that, I think to CBS or somebody, uh, bought the rights to that. So, uh, I don't, I never did ask him what he, how much money he made, but anyway, it is a, uh, definitely a, uh, something that he just did on his own. So, uh. It's pretty good, but it, it, it definitely will scare you to listen to it. Uh, the Browns, uh, Janet, the, the daughter, uh, was 16 years old, if I remember right. Uh, and her parents were probably killed more instant, I think instantly afterwards. And she lived for a little while and actually died en route to the hospital at Winfield. Uh, and so she was conscious and, and kept telling them that she wasn't going to make it either. And, and she did. So, 16 years old, she had her life in front of her. And that's what so many of the folks, and I think we need to tell that, you know, storms have no respecter of age or, or uh, anything. So we need to be prepared and these will come back. And it was that 1956 tornado that uh, led, I think it was Robert Baker to have that storm shelter that the that's Browns true. lived near and there were 14 people that sheltered. James, is that the shelter that you and JB were when you went, did your video back in Gwen? Is that the shelter that you all saw? It has to be. It, it has to be the same one. Yeah. There are 14 people in there. And he was, he was one of my, our good Minnesota folks that came to live with us. So <laughs> the Baker's <laughs> were. So, uh, and, and grew up with all these folks. Well, several several people in those survivor stories mentioned the radio station at Hamilton, and that they had received a warning that the tornado would, you know, would reach Gwen around nine o'clock. So there's no telling how many lives were saved by those those warnings and those broadcasts, Mayor. Sherwin Prescott. I don't know if you've ever heard that name. He was from Winfield. He was the disc jockey uh, on the Hamilton station that night, and he kept his composure. And was very calm during this all, and it was almost uh, uplifting just to hear Sherwin tell you the news, and he was able to get through that. But uh, he was uh, from Winfield, and uh, of course Hamilton being 15 minutes to our north, and Winfield about seven or eight to our east. So we're all close knit communities. Did uh, do you know if they had an oil weather wire uh, at that radio station? Well, they that did. was a that was a lifesaver right there. Yes. And Catherine, for Xenia, it was WHIO. Bill Whitney, right? If, was, if you had the TV on, yeah. You had the TV on, yeah. He was the hero doing the, the coverage there. But do you feel that people in, in Xenia knew that there was going to be bad weather that day? Actually, I have a, a little clipping from the April 3rd um, Xenia Daily Gazette on my tornado exhibit at work. And it it was the daily weather. They would put a little bit about what the daily weather was, and it said storms possible. So I think people knew, but I didn't think. I don't think they knew how bad it was going to be until Gil Whitney came on. And there is a hook echo. Watch out. Take cover right now if you are in this area. And but we didn't have the TV on at my house, and we had no sirens at that time. So yes, technology has changed quite a bit. Yeah. yeah, it was interesting Thankfully. talking to Lee because Lee, you know, that that hook echo on that radar showing the storm moving into Xenia is a powerful message. Yeah. And 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 Lee believes that night what you know, watching Channel 31 in Huntsville, you know, that all you could see were the hooks. Uh that told you everything. You know, James sometimes calls it a bucket of spilled paint. Um, you know, but you couldn't miss those that night those hook echoes were so dramatic and and that that xenia one just kind of took my breath away a few minutes ago when 
when I came across that image because it was not any question what was going on. Yeah. And, and Catherine, just like for the Guin tornado, you know, it, it hit Guin, but it kept going for quite a while. It was one of the longest track tornadoes for Xenia. After it hit Xenia, it, it went through a few rural areas and then it really uh, wiped out Central State University and the Wilberforce area and then continued yes. on into Clark County. What was some of the damage up in uh, Central State? Most of the buildings on the campus were damaged or completely destroyed. There was one man, Oscar Robinson, that died at the post office. And it went on and tore the roof off of a dormitory at, at the time, Cedarville College, and ended up out in Clark County. Um, Central State people wondered why, after they'd been hit, why doesn't anyone come from Xenia? They didn't know. There was no, the radar or the radio, all the power was out. They couldn't see that the damage in Xenia was as, as bad or worse. So they wondered why there was a, no one coming from Xenia to help. Wow. But yeah, there was, there was quite a bit of damage. We have photos from there. In fact, I got some recently that you haven't seen yet. Uh-oh. So, yeah, <laughs> Another couple coming things. back. <laughs> yeah, you'll you'll be back for a sixth time. <laughs> but that's okay. That's right. Oh. Yeah. Um anybody else have any questions uh before I ask a couple of, of final stuff? Bill, did you have anything else or James? Hey, hey Mayor, I, Phil, I I'm I'm curious. I shouldn't be asking this. This is a personal question. What what just out of curiosity, what year did you graduate from high school? 72. Okay. I graduated in 74. Um, and, and by the way, nobody should have hair that looks that good <laughs> graduated in 72. For, for those that are listening, M Mayor Phil has the best hair on the show here. I mean, wow. Yeah. That, well, that's that, outstanding. I mean, that's I'm just kind of, saying that's that is, kind of a low bar, though, James. <laughs> well, that, that's true. That, that is true. Very low bar here. But uh, so, no, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a class of 74 guy. Uh, th this was my year to graduate. 50 years ago and, and our 50th reunion is coming up. And, um, you know, it, it's, it, for me, it kind of defined me my senior year in high school. I'll, I will never forget. Um, after Jasper, we went to Gu and, and, and mayor, I thought the world was ending. I love storms. I couldn't wait for them. And, and, and I learned the year before we had a tornado in Brent, Alabama, May 27th, 1973. And we were sent down there. And that's the first time I've ever seen tornado damage. And I thought, well, maybe that's a once in a hundred year thing. And then the next year we had this. And when I got to you and it, it was, oh, goodness. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, and I'm old. And to this, and I've worked a lot of EF5s. F5s in my career, but I, I believe that Ewan was the most violent of them all. Um, but we went, we wound up in, Hunt, in Coleman and then in Huntsville. That was the last stop on the communication tour. And it's funny, I'll just, it's funny the things you remember, I'll never forget one of the local radio stations in Huntsville got back on the air. I understand most of these TV and radio stations, they were knocked off for days. Right. And it was WVOV, the voice of the valley, and they played. TSOP by MFSB. And I'm the only guy on this show that knows what that song was. That's well, not true. No, the Sound of Philadelphia. I remember it well. By MFSB. What was MFSB? That was mother, the initials father, of the people Mother, sister, the, yeah, brother. Mm -hmm. That was the name of the band. Mother, father, sister, brother. And that was the theme from Soul Train. <laughs> and just, every time I hear that song, it brings back memories of the super outbreak of 1974. But I wanted to ask both of you, if if there's one thing that you took away from it, one thing you want the world to learn from your experience, what, what would it be? The one thing you want everybody to know that maybe they don't know that they need to understand about that night. Catherine, I'll start with you. If you experience it, and I hope you never do, it will never leave you. Just always be prepared for the next one because there will be one. Bill? Bill? I think she's spot on uh, preparation. You know, there was, uh, it was funny. I was pondering that we had had some thunderstorms and the tornado in 56 and all, but when we would have one of those, the neighbors around my mom and dad would gather and they're going to build a 
really nice storm seltzer. They, they even a time or two got out and drove stakes where they wanted it and never finished it. Mm-hmm. And, and now if you go there today, you could probably get 25 in that storm seltzer. They, they all built after the, the neighbors went together and pooled their money and built one for the little neighborhood there. Um, as I said a while ago, these storms are not, they're going to keep coming. It's in a preparation, uh, and y'all, that it's the meteorology, you're touching lives, uh, what you do. And I hope you don't discount uh, your your job. But some people will not pay attention to the weather, uh, and they need to be reminded of how violent it can be and how it can take lives. And so be prepared and be educated enough to know and respect the weather, uh, I think would be the the biggest takeaway from this storm. And and is it true? I I heard that some people from Guin went to Hackleburg to help in 2011. Is that, was that the case? Yes. We we were, uh, the storms were coming in and they were going north of us. Uh, Mississippi softens them up for us. We used to say that, but, uh, Usually, uh, in my police, uh, police and fire came to me, and, and I was mayor in 2011, and they wanted to go to Hackleburg, and, and I let half of them go uh, because we had to, to have some stay here in case we had an emergency. But yes, uh, we we sent them to Hackleburg, uh, and, and did several. We we would pull the shifts after their storm and help them. I sent one of my garbage trucks up to help them with garbage. So we help each other. Uh, in, in this area and uh but hackleburg you know i knew that town pretty well but when i went up there i mean we're so bad to, to look at landmarks for directions and there was no landmarks mm-hmm. you know i couldn't find my way in hackleburg because they were all gone uh, so you know we uh and it happened and i remember the the weather uh uh folks told me in in, in the 40 year reunion said don't ever let your guard down it's going to come back you're going to have another storm. And so I don't know what they base that on other than the tracks that it repeats itself uh, or, or goes back. But, uh, you know, I have not forgot that. So uh, I want to constantly remind the folks that the weather uh, is serious and uh, we need to be prepared. I remember, I think Jim Stefkovich and I rode together up there for the 40th event. And, uh, I remember that message, but yeah, and that, that's my message, uh, you know, Phil and Catherine, I, I tell people all the time, listen, tornadoes happen to real people at a real place at a real time. And it's not always somebody else. And you might have an excuse. Everybody's got an excuse. It's always a valley, a ridge, a body of water, what their grandmama says. None of that matters. None of it. Um, and you know, we were hit, my house got hit three years ago by an EF three and, uh, the, and they really do, but it's always good to see, you know, communities like Xenia and you and giving back to other towns that have been hit, uh, over the years. So, uh, you know, it's to, to me, that's the right thing to do. I'll never forget the kindness of the people that showed up at our house the next day to help us restore some order where we can start to, you know, ha- have hope that things are going to be okay. And, uh, you know, the kindness of strangers, uh, that that's just very important. And, and if anybody understands it, it's people living you in Alabama and Xenia, Ohio. All right, yeah. Bill, do we need to bring in Bruce? I notice he's on the line now before we. Yeah, Bruce, uh, we've got special guests here tonight, um, Catherine Wilson from the Historical Society in Xenia and Mayor Phil Seagraves from Gwin, Alabama, two of the most, you know, memorable uh, city names that were hit on that April 3rd, 1974. I know we didn't have weather radio then. Weather radio was still sort of in its infancy. Uh, what role did the, the, did the April 3rd, 1974 outbreak have in the in the future development of the of the network of weather radio bruce well it was huge um in fact if you read the service assessment the national weather service service assessment for the 1974 outbreak NOAA weather radio is mentioned in there prominently three or four times uh and the importance of of, of expanding that service because at that time there were a limited number of uh, NOAA weather radio transmitters and most of them were in major cities. And so there wasn't very good coverage for the smaller towns and certainly for the rural areas. 
So that was 1974. One year later, 1975, President Gerald Ford signed the decree uh, setting up NOAA Weather Radio as America's official federal warning system and expanding this weather radio network to where now we have 1,033 transmitters. And it is still America's official federal warning system. Next year will be the 50th anniversary of President Ford signing that paperwork. So the 74 outbreak, because of the ferocity of the storms and the number of storms and the rapidity at which they were striking, it highlighted the fact that we were woefully unprepared as far as getting the warnings out. We had TV and radio stations that were willing to do the job and they did a great job, but the warnings were too fast and furious. And so in the aftermath of 1974, we developed, uh, the National Weather Service developed this weather radio network to make sure that these tornado warnings are received within seconds of being issued by your local National Weather Service office. And Catherine said earlier, she has two weather radios, Bruce, one yeah. at home, one at work. Absolutely. Um, so how do, we, how do we help people get weather radios in their hands? You've got a special offer for uh, WeatherBrain's listeners, and it's a reminder as we're just past Easter here and, you know, approaching Mother's Day and Father's Day and all these things, these are great opportunities to, uh, you know, to make sure that your family members, your neighbors, your friends are protected. Yeah, Mother's Day, Father's Day, wedding presents, baby showers. Uh, there are very few gifts that you can give someone that could save their life, but a NOAA Weather Radio can certainly do that. And it brings you a lot of peace of mind. Uh, as the mayor said, uh, you know, once you went through one of these things, it's this is something you never forget going through. And ever after, you can have post-traumatic stress every time the sky turns dark or the wind picks up and howls. So having a NOAA weather radio is not only protective against future storms, but it helps to allay your fears and your uh, insecurities and uncertainties during just an average spring thunderstorm. I think I, I can't say enough about these devices, and I'm not saying that because I work for this company. I've been saying this now for 45 years. Every home, school, and business in America should have a NOAA weather radio. And if you're a listener of Weather Brains, our promo code is SPAN25. That's S-P-A-N-N-2-5. If you go to MidlandUSA.com, you can order weather radios and get 25% off. That's the 25 in the SPAN25 promo code. So when you order it, it'll come up on the screen, some little place there or a little box where you can type in SPANN25, and that's the promo code that'll get you 25% off of Weather Radio. They do make great gifts, and there's no better way to tell someone that you care for them and you love them than to make sure that they have a device that allows them to make take full advantage of these life-saving alerts direct from your local National Weather Service office. Yeah, I, I mentioned today uh, our, our new hotel in Albertville was we're expecting severe weather in the in the valley uh, tomorrow night and across north and central Alabama, including the entire state. Uh, but I asked, you know, have we gotten the weather radio for Albertville? And the answer was no. And I was like, go right now <laughs> to, uh, you know, to the nearest Walgreens or CVS or Walmart or whatever it is and yeah. get a WR 120. Uh, because you know that's that's a required piece of equipment in our in our businesses, and that's just a reminder, Bruce, that uh, all businesses need it too. So, don't uh, don't take that for granted, James Ban. Sorry, I had to throw that in there. Yes, and let's take a quick break, and we're going to come back and wrap this thing up. We've got some. A lot of good stuff still to go here. So stay with us as Weather Brains rolls along. Join the American Meteorological Society's Weather Band at amsweatherband.org to connect with weather enthusiasts all over the world. Plus 10,000 plus members of the AMS. Swap stories and data. Join photo contests and interactive webinars or test your trivia knowledge. Full membership is just $12 per year. On Wednesday, April 3rd, AMS Weather Band will be hosting a special 90-minute webinar entitled A Day That Changed Tornado Research, a look back at the 1974 super outbreak. Panelists will discuss this historic day's synoptic setup and operations and some of the outcomes from research conducted on this event. Register at amsweatherband.org. 
So I do want to ask both of you, um, what are some of the things that are planned for the 50th? Catherine, what's happening up in Xenia on Wednesday? On Wednesday at 4 p.m., there is going to be a ceremony at the Tornado Memorial in front of the old city hall. And that should ask, last about half an hour. There are going to be speakers, et cetera. Hopefully it won't be too freezing cold. And at 5.30, there's going to be a, another thing out at the senior center. There's going to be light refreshments, several different entities that went in together on the commemoration, like the Historical Society, the County Archives, the Library, the City of Xenia, are all going to have different um, tables out there. And we will have, at the, for the Historical Society, we will have, it's called Tornado at Xenia. I don't have a copy here, so I can't show off what it is. But we're going to be able to sell that for donations for the Historical Society to benefit us. That sounds great. And I should be able to see you that day. Um, I'll actually be in Louisville in the morning. Um, I'm speaking at their commemoration, um, was invited by the National Weather Service. And then after that, I'm going to come back up before I get home and, and stop by and see you and Xenia. And um, and then Mayor Phil, Zach's coming to see you on Wednesday. What's happening in Gwen? Well, we have a remembrance service at the First Baptist Church. Our very own James Spann is our keynote speaker that night. I think we have some uh, folks from the National Weather Service that will be, be there as well as some other uh, TV stations from Birmingham and some from Mississippi. Uh, it's a special service that we've involved the beta club from our high school uh, these of course kids were not born at this time but they're going to have a special lighting ceremony of each person that was killed um, and in remembrance of them their name will be called out and mm -hmm. uh, that will be a special time of the service uh, so we're, we're coming together the other churches in the area have called their service off to meet uh, as a community at uh, one one church so it'll be a special night. We look forward to James and having him in Gila. That'll be great. And James, before we um, go to the picks of the week, I, I did feel like we needed a little comic relief. And so there, there is a piece of audio that I want you to play. It's from um, our friend JB, if you could play that. We got some criticism from an elder, elderly lady in the middle of the night on the uh, phone. Tell us about that, JB. <laughs> I'm afraid to. I'm afraid I might get... Uh, track down oh, go ahead <laughs> 2 32 a.m uh we were we were in a lull i went back to the radio room and got a cup of coffee and they most people listening around the country won't know what this is a delicious banana moon pie and sat down to take a break and the phone rang and i answered national weather service and there was a faint little lady's voice that said sir i'm calling from 50 miles away long distance so i can't talk long Back in those days, I think a long distance call was about 74 cents a minute or something like that. And she said, may I read some Bible verses to you and say a prayer for you? I said, sure. And she read a few Bible verses and said a prayer. And the minute she said amen, I knew I had been trapped. She lit into me and chewed me out completely. And he said, you guys up there in Birmingham are keeping the entire state awake tonight. And God is going to deal with you harshly. And then she said, uh, when you get to heaven, if you get to heaven, God is going to deal with you because of the very things you guys were doing this night. By then, I was uh, totally exhausted, just about ready to drop out of my chair. And I don't know why I said it, but I said, lady, if you don't get off the phone immediately, I'm going over to my super powerful radar, pick out the strongest thunderstorm in the state and reroute it right across your house. <laughs> 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 and all I heard after that was, oh, my God, click. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the night of the super outbreak, right, James? Yep. That was yep. when that happened. Oh, I could only imagine what that was like for the weather service and to, to have that phone call. So um, I thought you, you could lead picks of the week. And then um, we have a special audio that, that Bill has asked me to, I voiced it. Um, Bill, would you want to set up why you wanted me to voice this audio? That's how we're going to end the show. Um, well, I, me I mentioned earlier my my prized possession this April third, nineteen seventy four, a night to remember, um, and and to me this story is um, one of the most moving and haunting stories in that book uh, because she talks about at the beginning that uh, her little grandchild um, mentions to her that morning, 
you know, uh, I, I saw that a tornado was going to come and it killed mama. And I just, that just has always haunted me. Um, and so I did ask you to, you know, to read that as we go out tonight, because, you know, Jen, you're always, you know, paying tribute to the victims, uh, the people that, and it's not always just the victims who got killed, the, the victims who live carry this weight of, of this disaster. Uh, and so thank you for sharing that. I, I thank you for pulling those uh, audio clips too, Jen. They were very powerful. Um, there's that night I listened, I went back last week and listened to, to JB and Jay Shelley and Mr. Ferry and Alan Pearson. And when we asked Jay, James asked him, you know, what do you remember most? And, and this made me think of this when JB said that was the physical work that it took to do warnings in 1974. You know, now we, now we sit at keyboards and push buttons. Uh, you know, but it was physical work back then. And, and JB mentioning that he was exhausted, you know, they really were at the end of that night, they had given their all just as if they'd played a football game. And uh, thank you for sharing that. You bet. And, you know, uh, we, we actually had a communicator that was working at the weather service that had a mental breakdown in the middle of this and understand they, they were feeding teletype machines, Troy, Yeah. <laughs> you, you, and with these tapes and people today have no idea what it was like trying to push all of these warnings, warning after warning, using these mechanical teletype machines and their communicator back in the teletype room literally had a mental breakdown during the whole thing. And it was, uh, it was just one of those, uh, unbelievable nights, but, uh, do you remember what Mr. Ferry said to him, James? Well, he thought he was being electrocuted or something, yeah, didn't he? He I mean, said, he said, my God, man, you better be being electrocuted. <laughs> <laughs> and he got right back to work. <laughs> but apparently the, the guy just stood up on the table with all these tapes and just started screaming at the top of his voice. Uh, and, and these tapes clutched in both hands that they would feed into these machines. And uh, he just, uh, he lost it. So, uh, but re real quick. And again, uh, uh Catherine and, and Phil, uh, Phil, I'll see you Wednesday night, but I wanted to thank both of you for coming on the show. You've given us 90 minutes and you're, I know you're busy. There's a lot going on. So to both of you, thank you. And we'll, and we'll let thank both you. of you go. Cause we're going to do our picks of the week here, but, uh, uh, Catherine, thank you so much. And Phil, thank you so thank much. You. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Enjoyed it. All right. Th thank you all very much. And, uh, so let's do our picks of the week and, uh, we'll wrap this thing up with this special audio in just a second. So, uh, my pick it's, uh, you know, we have the eclipse coming up a week from today and, uh, a PhD student at OU, uh, Tomer Berg, he has this really remarkable data site and, uh, he's got, uh, ensemble forecast, uh, for national blend of models forecast all with the eclipse grid on them. So if you are trying to find a clear spot, Troy, I don't think you're the clear spot, are you? Uh, no, I'm, uh, I'm thinking rain and clouds here. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, a lot of people were going to head over toward Troy in Texas, or it just doesn't look good. Uh, yeah. and I would, I will say looking at his graphics, the better chance would be uh Maine or maybe Northern Vermont or New Hampshire or Northern New York, the way it looks at the moment. Yeah. Again, we're doing this on April 1st that that might change again, but, uh, uh, again, a lot of people have been waiting for this for a long time. These uh, don't happen that often here. So anyway, that, that's my pick of the week. It's his uh, solar eclipse data page, which has some really good information on there. Yep. All right, uh, Jen, give us a pick of the week from you. My pick of the week is our current release at tornadotalk.com of the Guin Alabama F5. We did the overview, which turned into a pretty much more than an overview, but we took this the storm from the beginning to the end of the path and highlighted uh, what happened with some imagery and uh, in-depth stories. And this is just the start of it. We're gonna take this now um, when we get past the anniversary and go even deeper into some of the stories with more imagery that we have. And uh, the mayor has just been wonderful working with us. Um, uh, so we have more stories to tell, so we'll be doing that. And then on Wednesday, we will have an overview for Xenia as well. Both stories, um, I've been living it for months now and, and both stories are just so powerful and it just, I, I can't tell y'all how amazing it was to have both of them on. 
to uh, to share their stories and how similar they were. And it's just here they are hundreds of miles away from one another and their stories were so similar. But uh, please go read the Guin story so you can get a little bit more in depth of what happened to that community and and the rural communities beyond Guin um, through Winston, Lawrence and Morgan counties. Yampertown, Twin, Del Mar, Haleyville. I mean, uh, places like yeah. that. Yeah, great, great, great work, Jen. So thank you. All right, Troy, give us something good. Um, to be honest with you, my pick of the week this week is Jen Naramore because uh, no one could put a show together like this and get our guest in there, Jen. So as usual, um, Troy, thank we you. love you. And so oh, I love you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Now, my pick of the week, actually, I mean, I pick out <laughs> Jen's always the number one pick of the week. Uh, I don't know if you all saw this or not, but it was on what do we say now? X and formerly Twitter. Um, a great picture. And you really got to look at this closely. If you haven't seen it, we'll share the the Twitter and then a, also an original picture with you. An ANA 787 taking off on um, on departure out of SeaTac back on Wednesday. A great shot of a cloud to ground lightning strike taken by Michael Snyder up in Seattle. He is on uh, Twitter, X, whatever, uh, is Seattle weather guy. An amazing picture. And if you look at it and you look in the base of that cloud, Bill, you saw it. There's the aircraft where the cloud to ground just enters the nose and, and exits the tail and then strikes the ground. Amazing picture by Michael Snyder, Seattle WX guy. And that's my pick of the week. Excellent. And all these picks will be up on weatherbrains.com. Bruce Jones, I know you got something good. Oh, I do. Uh, the Indiana Department of Homeland Security, their public affairs department, has been for the last couple of months uh, collecting stories uh, that they put together on a really nice website. The website is Remembering the Stories of 74, the Hoosier Experience of the 1974 Tornado Super Outbreak done by Indiana Department of Homeland Security's Public Affairs Department. It's a really nicely done website with some amazing stories on there. Indeed. We'll put that up on weatherbrains.com. Great pick. Bill Murray, go. Yeah, James, uh, I I found the um, Kentucky radio clips, uh, and they have a whole page of WHAS from Louisville, their coverage, and they're in big chunks. It's not little 15-second pieces. It's big, long 20 and 30 minute cuts with the music and the DJ and some of the most famous James, I don't know if you have time, we could listen to one of the most ma famous clips. If you've got it pulled up, if you don't, that's okay. It's queued right there at about 14 minutes and 50 seconds. I think if you, if you want to play that real quick, it's one of the most famous uh, recordings from the outbreak. Do you have it or which one, Bill? I'm sorry. Never uh, mind. It's the it was on my pick of the week. If you pulled, uh, I sent it right after that. Uh, just a, a specific segment where you know the the head of the weather service, Jim Burke in Louisville, is on the phone with the broadcaster from WHAS, and he says, "Hey, we got a tornado near the airport." And he like looks out the window, and he's like, "There it is. I gotta go." And he yep. slams wow. down the phone and. You could just that was just so powerful, you know. Hopefully, lots of people took uh, took uh, shelter uh, on all those great broadcasts. But it was a different world. Radio back then was our lifeline. James, we're going to talk about the super outbreak one more week next week. Lee Pinson, the the gentleman that you introduced me to, fabulous fella, uh, who lives in Huntsville still to this day and 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 works on rockets. Uh, hmm. But he was a sixteen year old kid that night. And um, he just has a tremendous recollection uh, about a very specific hero that I think we need to honor. A uh, week after that, we're going to have Heather Tesh from the uh, Weather Channel. And uh, on the 22nd, we're going to have the team from the Tennessee Valley Weather uh, Network up there. Uh, ben Luna, his group, uh, they're all going to join us and talk about what they're doing. Our friend Johnny Parker is going to be the guest panelist. And on the 29th, really special show – Christina Ballantyne, graduate um, research student. Troy, you met her at, at Starkville. She's going to come on and talk about her research about tornado warning visual effectiveness uh, with broadcasters. And we just got to make sure we have Kim here that night. Too bad we don't have Kim here tonight to talk about Purdue basketball, Alabama basketball, my, my team, Kim's team, in the Final Four. We may have to postpone the show a, a, show a night if uh, either one of us get lucky next week, James. 
Uh, boy, that Purdue, that how, how tall is that guy? I think uh, he's about seven, eleven, or twelve, wow. something. Mm. Yeah, he's a pretty big guy. Mm-hmm. He's also got a potty mouth, man. I I, I turned oh, on this post came interview after the. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this was live on national television. He was dropping f bombs. I'm thinking, really? man, <laughs> yeah, Woo. Oh, he and he, that guy could cuss the horns off a bull. Uh-oh. Uh oh, <laughs> all right. So, so all right. Uh, so anyway, it's been a great show tonight. And uh, Jen, anything else we need to say before we hit the audio here? No, I think we're just gonna we're gonna end it here and just on a, a solemn note. But just uh, it, this story is is pretty amazing, and it's Mrs. Quillian, and it was the Tanner. Is it Tanner one? Is that the, the tornado she was in, Bill? Um, yeah, the, and it's just the, a really yeah. The the first and one amazing thing, and I think I said this last week. You know, the second tornado hit that same house apparently because she told her husband they were protected in a a cocoon of bricks, and he said. Honey, there there was nothing left on the slab when I got there. So, you know, yeah. they had not pulled them out of that wreckage. That her and her children may not have have lived to tell the story. Yeah, it's uh, powerful stories tonight, and I'm just so grateful that we were able to have both Catherine and and Mayor Phil on. And um, you know, this is just our way of having a commemoration for this uh, you know 50 year event. So, thank you everybody for being here. And uh, thanks to all. And if you're new here, we're typically on every Monday night at 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Central. And you can watch us live. The video version is on YouTube, youtube.com slash weatherbrains. We know most of you listen. And we'll kind of get back to our more regular format next week. We'll come back with the email segment and some of the other things we typically do next week. But uh, on behalf of the entire Weather Brains crew, I'm James Spann. Thank you for listening. Have a great week and God bless. I am Mrs. Mary Quellian, and I'm going to share my views on what happened on the third day of April, 1974. When we got up early that morning, the wind was high, the highest and strongest that I ever remember in my life. I was outside setting out strawberries while my five-year-old boy, Chris, was inside the house toting water for me. He told his granny as he looked out at the sky, Granny, there's going to be a storm, and it's going to kill Mama. We were nervous all day. Then late that evening, while we were preparing supper, my mother-in-law, who had always been nervous of clouds, was listening to the storm warnings on the television. She was watching the clouds, too. We heard the storm warning and that a tornado was sighted northwest of Moulton. So she went out into the utility room and got my oldest boy, Chris, and brought him back in the house where we could all be together. When we were standing in front of a glass French door looking out over my brother Carl Letson's house, we could see a black thunderhead, but we couldn't see any funnel. We could hear a roaring sound, and she was begging us to get in the back room. She didn't know where we were going because we had nowhere to go. We started to go to the back room when a ball of fire flew from our television as if it was going to catch on fire, and it scared me. I ran into my kitchen while Chris was following me. After I pulled the main fuse, I went back to the back room. Chris got there already ahead of me. As I was going through the bedroom door in the northwest corner, we heard an explosion of splintering glass. My mother-in-law said, Lord, have mercy on us. What is that? I turned around and looked. Our whole front door was caving in on all of us. She wrapped up my one-year-old baby and poked him under the bed. My third child, Victor, crawled under the bed with him, but it was so low that none of the rest of us could get under it. Then Chris and his granny got down on the floor and pulled a quilt over their heads. My second child, Dale, said, Mama, I have always heard a closet is a safe place. I replied, well, sit down in there then. He sat down in the closet right there by us. I threw myself on the floor, turned around and said, where are my children? I saw my fourth child, Jackie Lee, at the end of the bed and I pulled him up under me. Then it seemed that the deafening roar, the explosion of splintering glass and wood and the whole thing was coming down on top of us. The only thing that we could think of was to pray to God to protect us because he was the only one who could save us. The tornado hit us and picked us up. We thought that we were gone and then it set us back down. It just seemed like circling us, twisting and snapping and the popping was deafening. I raised my head and looked above me. The whole ceiling and everything was gone. There was a gray swirling mass above our heads and the wall around us was rocking. I expected him to go any minute. When I grabbed my child from the foot of the bed, a big piece of house top came down on my leg, pinning me down and kept me immobilized. The tornado stopped for a minute. We were covered up with stuff and Chris had to dig himself out under the quilt. 
He rose up, looked at the dresser behind me and said, Mama, the glass isn't busted. Then the tornado hit us again. We put the cover back over our heads and it was the same thing all over again. The splintering, the crashing, the twisting and the turning just seemed as if they would never stop. Then it was over. The hinges of the closet door where Dale stayed was sucked while the closet door had been blown somewhere in the room. The bed where my children hid was thrown to the floor, knocking the mattress from the bed a good yard away from them. The side of the bed where the children hid was not busted while the other end was busted, keeping the children safe. My baby was screaming and crying all the time this was going on. I tried to reach for him, but I couldn't because I was pinned down by the beam that fell on my leg. I thought at one time that the pressure of the wind was going to send my leg through the floor. It was all I could do to keep from screaming. With God's help, I didn't. Chris helped his granny and the rest of my children out. Then he started clearing the stuff to help me get out. I told him to throw them through the window because one of them could fall on us again. He got a piece of wood to lift the beam up from my leg. I knew that if it ever fell back, it would crush my leg. Finally, Chris was able to pull it up enough to ease my leg out. Then I pulled with all my might to get my leg out from under that beam. I don't know whether I tore up my ligament or not because the blood was streaming down my leg and I, I didn't even realize it. I was even barefooted and I pulled my shoes out from under the dresser. I put them on without thinking. There was shattered glass and splinters all over the floor. My husband said later that, one couldn't even lay his hand down anywhere without laying it on splintered glass. My mother-in-law also said that she saw splinters of glass coming by her a good foot long. It was just God's will that I didn't get my eyes plucked out. I could hear my husband screaming and crying coming across the field. He didn't know there were storm warnings out until he started home. He was coming down Highway 157 up above Raymond Terry's. He saw the storm coming and he was trying to get to us. He had to whirl and run from it. He ran and stopped between two hills, and the tornado went over him. Before he could turn, he saw it pick a trailer up, take it up in the air, and just burst it all to pieces. He said that it was carrying everything in the world, wood, doors, windows, trees, and everything you could think of. He could see it, and he started back because if he went through it, he would have been caught by it. For the second time, my husband started back, and he saw the tornado coming again. He had to whirl, run, and stop from it, turned around, and was coming on. He tried to come in by Leonard Jones's to get us, but there were trees and power lines all over the road. He had to turn around and go back around Mr. John Henry Jones's. When he got to my mother's house, he saw that everything was gone. He said that he knew that we were gone, too. He was coming down the hill. He ran over the tree across the road before he could get to the bridge, ran into some power lines that were down, and he had to back up. He couldn't go any farther. He came across the field running with a little all red boy with him. I heard him screaming and crying before he could get to the house. Frantically, he asked, what about my boys? What about my baby? His mother was trying to get out to him because she was afraid that he might have a heart attack. When she met him, she said, son, you have lost everything you have. My husband answered, Mama, I've got my family, and that's all which means anything to me. God gave them back to me. He could have the rest of it. He carried us across the field, leading us around the power lines. He said that when he was coming across the field, he saw balls of hail as big as oranges lying on the road in front of him where he was coming. He got us back to the car and carried us up to his brother father-in-law's house, where we spent the rest of the night. When we got out of the house, we could hear people screaming and hollering for help down toward my uncle's. We thought that they were trapped under the wreckage. We didn't know at that time that they were my brother's children, Sharon and Ricky Lutzen, who were screaming and crying for help. I didn't know it until late that night. The end of the house where we stayed before my mother-in-law got us into the back room exploded and went to pieces. If it hadn't been for her, we would have been dead. The only wall that was left was a little bit right around the northwest corner bedroom towards my brother's across the road from me. I saw Bernard Letson's wife, Corinna, out early that morning working in her flowers in the yard. I saw my brother when he came home from work that day, waving his hand at me as he always does. His mother saw him take the tractor to go down in the field to plow. He had come in, and I suppose he had gone to his uncle's. I was told that he had just come in on his motorcycle and had got inside the house. I didn't see him then. I saw his little girl, Sharon, in the yard that evening, too. When the storm was over, I saw that their house was completely gone. 
Even the brick that was around his house had burst all to pieces. Mm -hmm. The car was left where the garage had been, and I was told that a block had been blown through it, which was found in the front seat. I never saw it. His truck in the driveway was thrown across the field and torn up. The trees and his house were picked up by the tornado and carried them all together. I don't know whether the Bernard Letson family were warned about the tornado or not, whether they were getting ready to go to church or not, because I was told that that Sunday before he left for church, he said, I have got to stand up for Jesus because it might be my last time. God was preparing him then. He didn't know that by the next Sunday, God would have taken him and his whole family with him. It was so awful. The little girl, Sharon, died before morning. People wouldn't even open the coffins and let us see them unless we just wanted to. We could have seen two of them, but we were advised not to look at them. My husband could have looked at them because he got back down there before they were picked up, but he wouldn't. He said that he couldn't stand it because my brother was in our house just the evening before talking to us. We had rather remember him the way we remember him last than to remember him and his family in that condition. They were better off than we are because they have gone home to be with Jesus. They don't have to stay here and wonder when the next one might come and be worried to death. As I sit here in my home today, the wind is blowing so lonesome. It reminds me of that day so much. It's going to be so hard and lonesome to live here and look across the road where my brother lived and knowing that he is gone and knowing how he went. Though with Jesus' help and only his help can I make it. My mother-in-law came to our house a day before the tornado to spend the night with us. The next morning, she meant to go home, but the wind was blowing so lonesome. It just seemed like that my husband and I wanted her to stay with us. I told her to stay on with us, that I would be worried about her down there in her house by herself. It seemed like she wanted to stay too. That evening before the tornado came, her other son, Kenneth Letson, came to the house. He wanted her to go home with him and spend the night with his family. She said that she believed that she would go, but somehow or another, she didn't want to go. So she decided to stay. She told him to come and pick her up the next day so that she could stay with him the next night. She said that it just seemed like God was leading her somehow or another to stay with us. She said that she wasn't taking the credit for saving her lives because she knew that God did that. But she said that she believed that God had a hand in wanting her to stay and help gather us into that little back room. I guess that's the truth because if she hadn't been there, we would have been on the other end of the house that exploded. I guess it just wasn't our time to go because if it had been, God would have taken us on anyway. It will always be a night that I will never forget. All the deafening roar, the splintering and the crashing, and only God's mercy was with us. If it hadn't been for him, we would have all been dead too.